God gave King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon a dream that Christians have studied and debated for years. In the dream, God showed the king a statue that represented the governments and kingdoms of the world right up until the glorious return of Jesus. A few questions remain unanswered, however, the most salient of which is the fourth kingdom Rome or is it the Islamic Caliphate? This dream of Nebuchadnezzar was only the first of many end-time visions God had the prophet Daniel record in his book. In chapter 7, we find the vision of the four beasts. In chapter 8, the vision of the ram and goat. Chapter 9, the 70 weeks. And in chapter 10, 11, and 12, we find the great vision. In future weeks, we will be releasing videos on all these visions. But this video is about Daniel 2 and the dream of the great statue because it's the one all the rest are built on. Until the year 2006, this wasn't much of a question. Nearly every Christian scholar up to that point assumed the fourth kingdom of the statue was Rome. It was an open and closed case, so much so that many Bible translations of that day included section headers that claimed the fourth kingdom was Rome. Now, those words weren't found in the text. They were headings added by the translators to help the readers to, quote, understand, unquote, the text. My NASB Bible has a heading titled Rome. But approximately 14 years ago, all that changed with the blockbuster book Islamic Antichrist by my personal friend Joel Richardson. In that book, he asserted the Antichrist will be Islamic. And in his subsequent book, Mideast Beast, he followed it up with detailed biblical exegesis that set the world of biblical scholarship on fire, debating the question of whether the Antichrist will be Roman or Islamic. A big part of this debate is interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a statue and who is the fourth kingdom. The reason for this is that the dream and the explanation by the prophet Daniel in those, we are never told who the kingdoms are. Scholars have had to infer it from clues that are given in the text. So let's look at the arguments presented by both sides to help you make up your own mind on this issue. If you're not familiar with this prophecy, let's give you the one minute version to get you up to speed. God gave King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon a dream, which scared the king because he knew it was a very important dream. He called in his advisors and wise men, but rather than simply asking him what the dream meant, he wisely asked them to tell him the dream and then what it meant, because he knew he might get any old answer if he asked what it meant, but if they could tell him what the dream was and what it meant, he might get the correct interpretation. The wise men and astrologers couldn't do that. They were dumbfounded. They responded to the king. The thing which the king demands is difficult. And there is no one else who could declare it to the king except the gods. The king was enraged and declared that they didn't tell him what the dream and its interpretation meant. The king would kill all his wise men. The wise men were correct. Only God could make this dream known. Now Daniel, who had just completed his training to be one of the wise men, sought the Lord and God provided Daniel an understanding of the dream and its interpretation. Daniel told the king, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. The king's dream consisted of a statue which comprised five layers made of different materials, a head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, a belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and toes of iron mixed with clay. The statue was then struck by a rock which crushed them all at the same time, and the rock grew to be a mountain that filled the whole world. This stone is the kingdom of God, which will crush the kingdoms of this world upon Jesus' return. And since the feet and toes of the statue, which are part of the fourth kingdom, will still be in existence when Jesus returns at his second coming, those toes will be the Antichrist Empire. So knowing 
what that fourth kingdom is, which is connected to the toes, is super important. It will identify the Antichrist kingdom. Let's examine this prophecy and see what we can learn from the interpretation Daniel was given. He told the king that he, Nebuchadnezzar, was the head of gold. About the second kingdom, all Daniel said was, after you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. This is the chest and arms of silver. Then Daniel continued, another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Before we begin to look at the fourth kingdom, however, which is the topic of this video, let's consider what we've learned so far, because it's important. Daniel told the king that the first kingdom was Babylon. It was made of gold and it was the head. Our English translations say the kingdoms that follow Babylon would be inferior to it. So what might this mean? One thing it doesn't mean is that Babylon was bigger or more powerful than the kingdoms that followed it. Here is a map of the greatest extent of the Babylonian Empire, which is seen in brown on this map. Persia, the next empire, the arms and the chest of silver is yellow. Notice that Persia was substantially bigger and Greece, the third empire, was even bigger still. Size was not the determining factor. So why were the subsequent kingdoms termed inferior? Well, the shocking answer is that in my opinion, the other kingdoms weren't inferior and the literal text of the Bible doesn't say that they were. To which I'm sure you're thinking, what is this man saying? My Bible says inferior. The Hebrew word translated inferior doesn't mean that at all. This Hebrew word ara is found 20 times in the scriptures and every other occurrence, it means land or earth. Daniel uses the same word just two verses earlier to say that Babylon filled the whole earth. And the very next verse, he uses it to say the bronze kingdom would rule the whole earth. In both cases, it is speaking of the same territory and that is Babylon. The very next Hebrew word, manak, literally means out from. So together, these two words literally mean out from your land. Look at what this verse literally is saying. Another kingdom shall arise after you out of your earth or out of your land. And yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth or land. This makes so much more sense than most of our English translations. The verse is talking about the land mass of Babylon and who will rule it in the future. This is important understanding. In fact, it is the single greatest key to understanding the identity of the fourth kingdom and why that identity has remained a mystery until recently. So let's state it again. God told Daniel the interpretation and that interpretation is that Babylon would rule the known earth at that time and that subsequent kingdoms would rule the same territory. Looking at the map of Greece, we can see this is true. So it stands to reason that the fourth kingdom will also rule this same territory. That is what the prophecy is all about. It's about the land or the territory and that territory was Babylon. So now we're ready to discuss Rome's control of the landmass that was Babylon, right? And that will prove that the fourth kingdom is Rome, right? Well, that isn't exactly correct. When the Greek empire dissolved, the landmass that was Babylon was divided. Rome controlled the western portion of a landmass, including Turkey, Syria, and Israel, and the Parthian Empire controlled the Babylonian motherland in the east. Neither Rome nor the Parthians can be the fourth kingdom because neither controlled all of the Babylonian territory. And the prophecy is about territory, remember? At this point, you are probably asking, you mean Rome never controlled Babylon? That can't be, I've seen maps saying they did. No, they didn't, with the exception of one year. 
The Emperor Trajan attacked and entered the city in 115 AD, but left soon after and died of a stroke while returning to Rome. His son and successor Hadrian then became emperor and gave up most of the Middle East, including Babylon. Rome held Babylon for only one year. That doesn't count as making it a kingdom. The maps show Rome's greatest extent, and that includes this one year that they held Babylon, because frankly, it is embarrassing to those who hold the theory that Rome was the fourth kingdom to not have them control Babylon. Neither the Parthian Empire nor Rome controlled the entire landmass of Babylon. So what was the fourth kingdom? Who was the next to control it? You probably already know the answer. The Islamic Caliphate conquered all of the land that was Babylon by AD 670. And by the strict definition of what it takes to be the fourth kingdom of Daniel 2, it's Islam, not Rome. The Caliphate was the fourth empire to conquer all the land that was Babylon. Now I'm sure this is the opposite of what you've been taught. I understand this. The reason your teachers have presented a different view is most of us look at world history from the perspective of Europe or even Israel. But Daniel 2 is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And it is from his perspective of Babylon, not Europe, not Israel. But of course, the conquering of a land isn't the only proof the fourth kingdom is Islam and not Rome. If we look at the text of Daniel 2, we will see what it says about the fourth kingdom. Does that support the theory that it was Islam or does it support Rome? We are given one major clue. We are told this fourth kingdom will break and shatter all the kingdoms that came before it. Did Rome break and shatter the Greek empire that came before it? Well, we know it didn't break or crush the landmass, did it crush Greek culture, however, and substitute its own? No, not by a long shot. They copied Greek architecture, had similar gods to Greece, just with different names, and in Israel, they even permitted worship of Yahovah. Romans used the Greek language as the language of their business. Rome didn't crush Greek culture or the cultures of other captured nations. They adapted them. But what about Islam? Islam crushed the cultures they invaded. Not only did they crush and capture the geography of the previous kingdoms, they forced their monotheistic god, Allah, on the conquered peoples at the point of a sword. They instituted new architecture and the Arabic language, and above all, they forced their Sharia law and calendars on their foes, changing the laws and the seasons. Islam means submission, and they forced their captives to submit to their culture. Islam is a much, much, much better match with the Bible's description of the fourth kingdom. Not only does the rise of the Islamic Caliphate match scriptures about the fourth kingdom better than Rome, its demise does as well. Daniel told us that Jesus will break into pieces all four kingdoms upon his return, all at the same time. And that's easy to see with Islam. If the caliphate is revived, it will include all of Babylon, Persia, and Greece, and they would all be destroyed at the same time the caliphate was destroyed. But this is not true for Rome. As we have seen, it did not include all of Babylon, and it included none of the Persian Empire. So if it is revived, it will not include those other kingdoms, and then they wouldn't be destroyed along with Rome if Rome was destroyed. In fact, honestly, there is really nothing to support Rome as the fourth kingdom, nothing. To which you might say, wait a minute, it was the fourth kingdom in time. It came right after Greece, right? It was the fourth kingdom, one, two, three, four. Unfortunately for Rome, even this is not true. The Seleucid Empire replaced Greece, not Rome. It was the fourth in time, if you count the Seleucids as a separate empire. And frankly, the Romans weren't even fifth. The Parthian Empire existed over a hundred years prior to Romans. They were fifth, Rome was sixth. 
Let's look at the final aspect of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the feet and toes, and see if it fits with Islam or with Rome. We are told by Daniel that the fourth kingdom will be a divided kingdom. No kingdom on earth has ever been more divided than Islam. The divide between Sunni and Shia is deeper than just land or politics. It is about which one is the proper Muslim religion. It cuts to the very soul of Islam. No divide in a revived Roman Empire could ever be as deep. Even the Bible attests to the divided and conflicting nature of the Arab peoples within themselves. In Genesis 16, 11 through 12, where Ishmael and his descendants are prophesied about, they are said to have their hands against everyone and everyone's hands against them. So in every aspect we have looked at, Rome is a poor second to the Islamic Caliphate as a candidate to be the legs of iron, the fourth kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. The reason Rome has dominated, however, in Western nations' discussions is because Europeans and their descendants have been the ones having those discussions, and Rome has had a central place in the development of Europe. Additionally, a hatred for the Roman Catholic Church has also fueled this position. But if we look at the question rationally and biblically, the Islamic Caliphate is the only scripturally sound option.